Hey everyone, this is Ari Melder in MSNBC Studios, and we are coming to you live on YouTube. Uh, this is a tough and challenging time for everyone for all of the reasons the pandemic makes it hard. And we, like many other people, are experimenting, experimenting with different things. That includes new broadcasts we want to do on YouTube, not only to engage directly with all of you watching, whether you're in the United States or around the world, uh, but also to get in depth and in deeper to certain issues that we might not always have time to cover with the understandable focus on this coronavirus pandemic and medical and health news each and every day. So without further ado, let me bring in my special guest. If you are an MSNBC viewer, I bet you know her. Please welcome Maya Wiley, uh, former federal prosecutor in the Southern District of New York, former counselor to the mayor of New York City, among many other uh, pieces of expertise and professional history. I'm naming a few. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Ari. Um, Maya, we wanted to do this, as I was just explaining to folks who, who might be watching us live, and, and we'll keep this up online afterward as well, to really dig into some things uh, that go beyond the daily co coronavirus updates, which obviously we're doing and matter for so many reasons. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to, to kind of talk to you about what do you think the role is of law and policy uh, during an emergency pandemic like this? Day to day, we talk about how to keep safe, how to wash your hands, where's the testing at, what's the death toll? And you, by the way, of course, uh, have a lot of experience in New York City government, which is dealing with this. Um, but when we look a little broader out and we think about the, the racial and, and poverty disparities we've discussed, when we think about what the limits are on power, be it governors or president, the president, um, how do you think our law and policy part of this is holding up? Well, that's really a, an important question. You know, the thing about a pandemic is it lays bare the underlying unfairness, policy failures, um, inequalities that were already there. And in a lot of respects were there because either laws were not enforced, uh, the right laws were not passed, and that we need more policy solutions. And I, I think we're seeing that not just in the day-to-day -day statistics of this pandemic, but in real questions around what does government do to be responsive in a crisis that also keeps its eye on how it's going to recover. Because we're not just talking day to day about statistics and life and death, which is critically important. We're talking about if the most vulnerable people to this virus are also often first responders or essential workers, or we're making policy decisions about who has to go back to work or they will lose their unemployment insurance, whether or not it's safe, whether or not we're enforcing occupational safety rules like we just heard with meat manufacturing production in the United States with the Trump administration literally saying we're going to reopen meat and poultry uh, and yet we still have a testing crisis and we have workers who apparently aren't going to get the benefit of the enforcement of our safety laws, our workforce safety laws. So those are conversations we have to have about the relationship between the rights of people in this country to feel that the government is responsive to their needs balancing how to keep everyone safe with the ability to exercise constitutional rights. That's obviously an important question. And at the end of the day, it's really about, are we all going to recover or only some of mm. us? And I think that's yeah. an important well, conversation we have to have about why we see more people who are black dying. Yeah. Well, and let me dig into that because one of the issues we've we've been looking at a little bit uh, on air, but I want to dig more deeply in here in our in our YouTube live special with you, Maya, is when you look at the prison population, uh, you have these sudden questions about, well, if someone is near the end of their sentence, uh, should does it really make sense to keep them incarcerated at a higher risk if they're about to get out anyway, or if someone is elderly, or if someone is elderly near the end of their sentence and nonviolent. But then, of course, as you were just alluding to, you're peeling back the larger problem with the prison system, which is why are there elderly people serving long sentences for nonviolent offenses in the first place? Many countries don't even do that to begin with. Um, and, so, you know, on TV, we're very formal. But here for YouTube, I'll just say, like, I got my, my Wiley notes here. And one of them is 
You know we got to talk about the one thing that unites Michael Cohen and Takashi 6 9 You know what that is? They're both prison? getting out of prison. <laughs> yes, bingo. And yeah. they're getting out of prison for the coronavirus argument. And I'm curious if you can walk us through how do you balance the humanitarian issue, which is I don't care who the person is. Uh, the government has a human rights responsibility not to both confine them and put them at greater risk of disease or death, who, no matter who it is. But then flip that towards what we're seeing, which is, is yet again the people with connections, money, lawyers, uh, who can get themselves out, whether that's a former Trump lawyer or a, a, a rich artist, while a lot of other people, of course, are still stuck. Yeah, it's... Look, a lot of this, as you're saying, Ari, is about resources, not about safety. Uh, one of the problems mm. we have is that we assume when we see low-income people, particularly if they're black or brown, that they're not going to be um, able to operate out in society without being a danger to, to society, which is a stereotype that is simply often untrue. There obviously are people who commit violent crimes, but the question is, balancing this issue of not just public health, but what, what does incarceration serve? When we're imprisoning someone, what is it that we think we're getting out of it as a society? Because what we know is probation and parole, we have a whole bunch of people going back into the prison system for what we call technical violations. I mean, Meek Mill had this problem, right? And it really actually was important to shining a light on it because he had fame and followers, but it's a common problem for a lot of people where something very yeah. small, like we have someone who's, who's back in, in jail because they, they boosted a bike, right? Now, was it good that they boosted the bike? They needed some place to get to. They took it. They got there. They're back in prison. Not exactly the person who is somehow deeply unsafe for society. So we have to figure out what kinds of supports do people need so they can get their lives back on track? Right. Because the other and, thing and to we're be clear, ignoring is how many people can't get a job. And but part of I just want to be clear, part of what you're getting at is the coronavirus might create the headline where you see Michael Cohen or whomever's out. But you're saying it's the entire underlying system that we're shining a light on, that that it was a problem before and will remain a problem until you do the, the that structural reform. That's absolutely right. And, you know, we have to be careful how we talk about people like, you know, Michael Cohen. You know, certainly he is someone who was deserving of getting some, some time in prison. At the same time, when you have a pandemic, uh, you certainly don't want all the white collar criminals to be the ones who get out and other nonviolent offenders because they're poor to stay in. But the reality is, Oftentimes, the poor people were staying in longer even before the virus for reasons that just had to do with their poverty. So, you know, you, we can be upset about Michael Cohen and whether we think he should have been in or out. I actually think the principle has to be a public health principle, and it has to be right. about whether or not we are giving people the opportunity to live lives without committing crime. And, you know, Ari, right. you know, as you and I both know, there's so many people who are committing crimes because they can't get a job. They're, they're literally right. not able, they're, they're economic crimes of opportunity, or they need drug rehabilitation. We know that when we send people through drug courts and get them into treatment programs, we have a tremendously good success rate and certainly much more than if we just send them to prison at helping them get their lives back on track. Right. That's actually well, and a you're, policy you're talking... and a legal conversation we should be having. Yeah, and you're talking about shining a light on how the system actually works, and, and we know an emergency in a pandemic here in so many ways is doing that, but then you have to help make sure we understand well, what's the underlying reason. Uh, you know, someone who hops in their Ferrari because they can afford to drive one and goes 100 miles an hour because they feel like it uh, has a very low risk of going to prison, and they are literally putting other people's lives at risk, uh, and yet we deal with that almost primarily through the civil approach. Right. When I say to people, oh, on air, I say, oh, my wife was a civil prosecutor at the SDY. It means you're working on the civil side, not the criminal jail prison side. But 
then you have other people who are doing something that, yeah, as you say, it's not to say it's okay and there, there should be a system and a sanction perhaps for it, uh, but the public health and public safety question of, do you want to do long-term prison sentences for those people? And now we're just seeing a light on that. Another thing I want to get to, again, because we're using these live YouTube sessions to kind of hit some things that we don't have as much time for during the daily virus coverage. Before this pandemic exploded across the world in the United States, uh, I think many people watching will remember one of the biggest stories was whether Attorney General William Barr was going to be able to hold on to his job uh, because there were thousands of people in both parties and many of them nonpartisan type attorneys who were calling on him to resign based on the alleged documented uh, steps he took that appeared to meddle on behalf of the president to get a lighter sentence for his buddy Roger Stone. Now, here we are. Let me reset for everyone. Roger Stone is still about to report to prison unless something intervenes. He is facing a, a serious term. The president has tweeted and talked about the case. Mr. Barr's interference seems to have melted away. He may have been very lucky by the quote unquote news cycle. Um, and then you have the ongoing thing, and I've got plenty of articles here about it, Maya, where during this pandemic, the president took the opportunity to oust the independent watchdog who initially handled the Ukraine whistleblower. Uh, to do other meddling in the actual watchdogs that deal with the trillions coming towards coronavirus. And Attorney General Barr seems like he's back to business as usual. So let me give you the mic with more time than you get on television sometimes to walk us through all of that. And one of the questions that people may ask, which is, is it fair? Is it okay for a seemingly, imp obviously important, but seemingly arbitrary change of focus in Washington around the country to take the heat off some of those issues? Look, you know, as you know, I'm one of the people who thought Bill Barr earned himself an impeachment inquiry. <laughs> so I'll start there. You know, this is a attorney general who operated more as a defense counsel for Donald Trump than the nation's top law enforcement officer. Let me point to something we don't talk enough about that relates both to what we DOJ should be doing during this pandemic and what Barr is not apparently paying attention to. And that's the way that white supremacist groups have been on the increase in terms of recruiting using conspiracy theories during this crisis. What's Bill Barr doing? He's threatening states and local governments that are trying to keep populations safe by listening to public health officials rather than repopulating and asking for more funds to deal with right. a significant domestic terror issue. That's let me read what we're that for with. viewers. And this is the same Department let of Justice. Let me read the quote and then I'll let you hid this, the report. Let me explain just to keep everyone up to date because you're, you move, your mind moves fast. Uh, here's what, what one of the things Mr. Barr uh, is doing, and this is from a new Justice Department memo quote. He says, many policies that would be unthinkable in regular times have become commonplace, uh, citing the pandemic. Quote, we don't want to unduly interfere with the important efforts of state officials to protect the public, but he says the Constitution, quote, is not suspended in times of crisis, and he's been echoing uh, the way that Trump uh, has downplayed and interfered with the public safety rules. So go ahead and walk us through your analysis of that. Well, first of all, let's say, where was the Bill Barr who now cares about the U.S. Constitution and not using a pandemic to cross the line? when his Department of Justice sent a memo to Congress asking for the power to ask chief judges to basically suspend our constitutional rights to seeing a judge if they so choose for as long as they so choose. I mean, that's habeas corpus. It's written into the Constitution. It was an outrageous attempt at pushing an ideological position that was not good for anyone, telling someone if you get arrested, but we deem it an emergency. We will ask the chief judge to say, we don't have to bring you before a judge to decide whether or not you should be held in jail or not during a pandemic. That's essentially what Bill Barr said. Now, and so he now he cares about constitutional rights when it comes to advancing what Donald Trump has made very clear is his agenda to basically put people back to work, whether it's safe or not allow governors to threaten people off of unemployment insur insurance, 
at a time when they may have very significant reasons for being fearful about their pub, their health. It, 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 it is an example of a Bill Barr who's not paying attention to the law enforcement interests of the country. When in 2018, the greatest number of, of violent incidents that were there were terrorists in this country were perpetrated by white supremacists, and they were refusing to share the data with the Senate Intelligence Committee. That This is an administration, and this is a William Barr, who is not putting our best interests at heart. He's putting an ideological mm. position at heart, at heart. It, during the time of a pandemic, when what we need most is not ideology, mm. it's evidence. What we need most is not a man who's going to drive Donald Trump's political future and agenda. It's a, a person who's going to pay attention to what best serves the health, safety, and constitutional rights of our citizens. This is not what Bill Barr is doing. Hmm. Uh, really important, I think, to, to get that out there. And we'll continue to cover it on TV as well. But I wanted to get your full views on all that. Um, the final thing I want to do, Maya, is... Uh, get to a question I know you wanted to hit on uh, that's big picture going towards November. Uh, and also, I want to talk to our, our YouTube viewers. You know I, I try to keep it real, Maya. You know the saying, keep it real with me, I'll keep it real with you. So I want to keep it real with everyone well, who's watching you know, us on YouTube live. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is, you know, one of the things we need to be concerned about is, you know, how do we keep people safe and allow them to exercise their constitutional right to vote. The, right. We have a president. So who let me has do this because we're on a slight delay. I'm going to give you. Them. I'm going to give you the final word on the entire thing, looking towards November. Uh, before I do, I want to keep it real with everyone on YouTube. We are just trying this out and figuring this out. So in the comments here, live, and we're going to leave this up. If you have other questions, if you want to see Maya again, or you have other questions for Maya, put them in there. Uh, we and our team will check that out. If you have ideas for other guests, people you know, you've seen on MSNBC and we want to go deeper, or other people you think we should try out, uh, please put it in there because we're going to try to experiment. This is a this is a, a tough time, a different time, but there's ways to do innovation and listen to you guys. So I wanted to throw that out there before we sign off. And then I want to give you the final thought, which is, Maya, when, when we were setting this up, one of the things you said was, beyond the daily news, uh, this constitutional rights issue going towards November, voting rights, big, big issue. Uh, walk us through what I think you were starting to do, which is, as our, our final question, uh, what are we bracing for in November? How do people exercise their rights if they are still worried about the health risk of going out there, depending on where they live in the situation? Um, and what are the boundaries here? Because you see on the internet, we got people asking, wait a minute, can you just reschedule the, the general election like they did some of the primaries? Yeah, well, I mean, the short answer is only Congress can reschedule the general election, and uh, that's we have the ability to enable people to vote safely. We know how to do it. There's several states in this country that already allow mail-in balloting. New York State, the governor has just said, will allow essentially everyone who wants to to vote absentee ballot for public health reasons. That is something that the federal government should be supporting and resourcing in every single state with an addition for vulnerable populations, that is people who are low income, people of color, people who are elderly, people who have disabilities, people who live on Indian reservations, who, who need more resource support to understand where and how to vote, uh, who, for whom mail-in voting doesn't always work effectively. There are many states that have models and solutions. If this federal government keeps refusing to help bail out states so that they can go back to doing the people's business. You know, governors, both Republican and Democrat, have passed for $500 billion to keep going, to keep serving our residents. But part of that includes the resources to do all the things that they have to do to make sure this is a fair and safe election in November. And it's not apparently in Donald Trump's interests. And we as citizens have to fight for the mm. right to vote and demand that the Justice Department ensure that nobody's engaging in shenanigans that impair our lawful right to vote. Mm. Uh, really well said. It's an important issue. I know it's near and dear to you. And I know 
uh, you live it as well as talk it, because you've done a lot of work out there on this, which is why we rely on you as an expert. I'm not going to speak for anyone else. I will speak for myself and say, for a first test of this, I was very happy to get uh, even more in-depth and, and additional ideas and thoughts from Maya Wiley. We'll see what the people say, Maya. And thank you for doing this with me. I appreciate you, Ari. Stay well. You too. Stay safe, everybody. Stay informed. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching uh, this MSNBC Live here on YouTube. Subscribe to MSNBC. Subscribe to Ari Melber. And if you are near TV, check us out 6 p.m. Eastern on the beat. We'll have more tonight. Bye, everybody.